And hello, everyone. Welcome back to our final panel and plenary of the first day of the Missing Peace Global Symposium on Conflict-Related Sexual Violence. This last panel will be talking about the lessons on wartime sexual violence from different conflict settings. So I also imagine that we're going to have a very good discussion uh, after we hear our introductory remarks from all the panelists. I'm very pleased to introduce you to my colleague and longtime friend, Dr. Chantal de Junge Udrat. She is a global fellow at the Environmental Change and Security Program at the Wilson Center, and she served as president and CEO of Women in International Security, otherwise known as WISE, from 2013 to 2021. She was also formerly at USIP as the Associate Vice President of Fellows, which is where we got our start as colleagues. And she is going to take this panel. Thank you so much, Chantal, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Kathleen, and uh, welcome to our online audience. Uh, so today we have examined conflict-related sexual violence along different angles, uh, but as Kathleen said, we thought it would be useful to bring in perspectives and experiences from specific conflict settings uh, and examine the differences as well as the similarities uh, between these conflicts. Now, we could have picked any number of cases, and there is... Uh, unfortunately, a great number of them, uh, Sudan, Ethiopia, Nigeria, but we have also, we could have looked at past cases, uh, Korea, Bangladesh, uh, Northern Ireland, Bosnia, um, and we have many experts on these cases in the audience, and I would like to invite you to, uh, in the Q&A section of this session, uh, to share your assessments and findings uh, in terms of the cases you've been looking at. But to help us start off this discussion, we have a terrific panel of experts from the DRC, Ukraine, Burma, and Colombia. So let me briefly introduce you to them. Uh, next to me is Ali Bitenga. Alexandre, who is a social scientist based in the DRC and deeply engaged in community-based programming that seeks to address the impacts and consequences of conflict-related sexual violence in the DRC and particularly in the Eastern region. Uh, he also works very closely with the Ponzi Hospital, uh, the hospital of Nobel Peace Prize winner or laureate Dennis Mukwege. Next to Ali is Sofia Kornieva, who is a lawyer and specialized in international criminal and human rights law. She's based in Ukraine and she works with many international organizations, but also with many Ukrainian non-governmental organizations on gender-based violence and conflict-related sexual violence. Next to her is Weiwei Nu, who is a legal expert and political activist and founder and executive director of the Women's Peace Network in Burma. Through that network, um, she works to build gender equality, peace, and mutual understanding between Burma's ethnic communities and to empower and advocate for the rights of marginalized women throughout Burma. Uh, and she has had a particular focus also on uh, sexual and gender-based violence. And then last, but certainly not least, Rosa Emilia Salamanca, who is a feminist peace builder, human rights activist based in Colombia. Um, she's been a very active participant in the national and international debates and negotiations to secure peace in Colombia, and is a driving force behind Colombia's Women, Peace and Security National Action Plan. And her motto is security, not through control, but through care. So with this extraordinary panel of experts, we want to focus on two main sets 
uh, of questions. First, we want to talk a little bit about the perpetrators. What are, who are the perpetrators? What are their motivations? And what are the different patterns of sexual and gender-based violence? And the second set of questions then has to do with the responses, both by national and international actors. Uh, and we want to focus also on the recommendations that you, as experts, have in this regard to be able to stop and prevent conflict-related sexual violence. So Ali, let me start with you. Um, as I mentioned, your work focuses on the Eastern DRC, uh, where we're dealing with a long-standing conflict between government forces and a whole array of non-state armed groups. Um, the conflict, we all know, has resulted in massive and widespread conflict-related sexual violence. Can you tell us a little bit more about the perpetrators? Who are they? What drives them? Um, and I think you also have some very interesting examples about the variation even within the groups. We've talked a lot about variation, that conflict-related sexual violence is not inevitable when we're dealing with war. Uh, so please, Ali. Yeah, thank you very much, Chantal, for the floor. This is a, a very interesting question. Uh, you know, uh, as Chantal said, I, I have been working at Panzi Hospital for, uh, for, for 10 years now, and we have seen many victims uh, coming to the hospital, and previously our research was based on the stories uh, related by victims. And uh, one day I discussed with Dr. Mukwege and we said, okay, we need to shift them because we don't understand these things. Women coming to the hospital, they not only raped, but some genital parts cut, or the, 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 the rebels decided to shut in, which is really terrible. And then we decided to go and speak to soldiers from the Congolese regular army or from armed groups to understand the motivations of this uh, act of violence. I know there are so many experts in this room that I have been reading in the literature, and it's my pleasure to meet them. So what I'm going to say is what soldiers told me. Uh, I, I'm not going to be theoretical first. <laughs> At first, uh, I will report what the field, what soldiers reported about motivations of sexual violence in armed conflict. So, so when we asked soldiers why they commit this act of violence, there are so many explanations. Because the discourse we had before, it, and, and we, that we didn't understand profoundly was that sexual violence is a weapon of war. But when, of course it is, I'm going to get there later. Uh, uh, but soldiers and rebels gave multiple complex explanations. Some of them reported about urges. Uh, some soldiers believe that a man cannot stay uh, for a long period of time without uh, having sexual intercourse. So this is a biological. That might be simplistic. I'm not saying it, but I'm saying what soldiers uh, told me. So please. <laughs> uh, so this is a physiological explanation. But when you analyze this very closely, uh, you find out that this transcend physiological explanations and it is connected to ideas of masculinity. Uh, so, so some men, some, some soldiers believe that a man is a person who should be active sexually. And, and, and when it, he stays for a long period of time without sex, when he has an opportunity to commit sexual violence, he will. Some soldiers said that, not me. Uh, but others reported that sexual violence is a spoil of war. Uh, and, and when does it happen? It's very, a very important question uh, because we have this discourse of sexual violence as a weapon of war, which is true, I'm gonna explain it. But soldiers do not come in the village and start raping first, especially when there is resistance. Soldiers told me that when they are fighting with enemies, they focus on fighting, so they don't think about sexual activities until the war is, is won. Uh, and when the war is won, 
in French, there is an, an expression that they, they told me that fuir du territoire conquis, uh, which means uh, search in the conquered uh, territory. So you, you, you have, if you, you have won the war, you have to look, okay, what is, you have to, to, to find out what is in this territory. And then all the properties of your enemies, including their houses, uh, their staff, and their wives. This is not me, please. This is what the soldiers are telling me. Become yours. And then to enjoy, to be happy, because they have won the war, they start committing sexual violence. Uh, the soldiers told me during the war, during the active fighting, so their genital, the, uh, the, the genital parts cannot function properly. The, the, their penis, this is exactly the expression. The penis goes off, so it, they can't get erected because you are, you are worried about being killed and you want to kill the enemy. Uh, well, and, 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 and some other soldiers told me that Sexual violence is like a reward, a reward after, after sexual violence. A commander who is a, is a commander in the Congolese regular army told me that he was in a fight, in a war in Katanga, and then he, uh, he, he won his, his, armed, uh, his armed group, won the, the, the battle, and then people came to loot a shop. Uh, uh, but he, he protected the shop from being looted. And then later on, the owner of the shop came and told him that in, ex in, in the road for what you have done for me, you have protected my shop. I give you my daughter as a wife. Um, and you see, this is connected to gender inequality because the father should not decide on the marriage of, of, of his daughter because there are so many there are debates in the literature, is sexual violence connected to gender inequality or not? So researchers are fighting there. So I'm, I'm just reporting what soldiers told me. Um, and again, some soldiers say that sexual violence is an instrument of humiliation, uh, of intimidation, uh, a weapon of war, simply. So I'm gonna give an example one told me that he was in a fight in Fizi, and that it was a fight between the Congolese regular army and the Mai Mai armed group. And then the Congolese army lost the battle, and the group of Mai Mai started singing because they were, they were very happy that they have beaten up the regular army. They started singing, today is a great day. We shall rape your daughters and your wives today. Of course, men are also victims of sexual violence, but I'm just repeating what he told me. Well, the, the, the Congolese soldiers from regular army, some ran away, others were hiding in houses. It was a psychological attack on, on, on them. So my wife is gonna get raped today. They felt very demoralized. But this soldier continued and told me, later on, the commander of the Mai Mai armed group took a megaphone and said, and, and said, today, on the, oh, he said, on this occasion, no systematic rape is organized. Any soldier who is going to rape, he will be severely punished. And collective massive rape did not happen because the commander took a megaphone and ordered his troop not to commit sexual violence. So there are so many things that we can learn from this, uh, uh, from this experience. You see, if the commander says, on this occasion, no sexual violence is organized, that means sexual violence was deliberately planned, organized, on previous occasions. Uh, but also we can learn that sexual violence can be prevented. He asked his troop not to commit sexual violence, and nobody did it. So yeah, that's... Uh, a really uh, interesting example. Uh, so sexual violence was basically perceived as the highest form of humiliation. So, so when they rape, they said when they rape women or men, not only they target women, but it's, the idea is also to demoralize uh, the, uh, their husbands or brothers 
uh, and sisters, because I'm going to conclude Chantal. So, um, one, so another soldier told me about the war in Shabunda. Uh, the, 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 the RDC, which was an armed group backed by Rwanda that was active um, in DRC some decades ago, they were fighting somewhere in, in, in Shabunda against the Mai Mai uh, armed group. And then the, the RDC won the battle, but they were angry because the community, the community was feeding, was providing food to these Mai Mai's because these Mai Mai's are boys, are men from, from this community. And when they lost the battle, the people from the communities hid them in their houses. And then the, 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 the enemies get angry. Say, Today we're gonna show you. They, they bring all people from the community in a football ground. They separated men from women, uh, uh, married women from unmarried women in the foot football ground and started committing sexual violence on a woman after another, and some men of, were, were of course uh, raped. Uh, so it was a kind of lesson to teach the community that they should not be supporting uh, the, uh, the, the rebel groups. Uh, one, about variation, the, the concept of variation is very important. When we say that some arm, armed groups commit sexual violence and others don't. But this is very simplistic. This is a very simplistic explanation. So you can't say these arms groups do not commit sexual violence because sometimes it will be it will be it will be an order received from the commander and sometimes it will be a personal motivation. So I, would, I don't know an armed group whose soldier has never has never raped because, for example, the FRDC in uh, in 20, uh, 2016 they committed public rape in Kasai, in central Kasai. Uh, against a religious group uh, when, during the uh, Kamwen and Sapu uh, armed, uh, 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 during the Kamwen and Sapu war. Because the Kamwen and Sapu rebels fight, fight, were fighting against the government and they, they wore red uniforms. And there is a religious group in central Kasai that put on uh, red clothes, it, it, that, that the clothes for the, the religion. And then the FRDC soldiers confused those people uh, f uh, from uh, the Kamwen uh, the armed group. They raped them systematically. This is a government, a, a government force raping uh, women. But also in another context, I heard of stories that FRDC soldiers went to fight against Interahamwe and liberated female women who were kept captives uh, uh, by the inter <clears throat> You know, sometimes they rape and sometimes they play a different role. So there is a, a kind of complexity. Uh, I don't have much time. Maybe we'll continue the discussion later. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you, Ali. And I think the complexity is indeed very important to underline, as well as, uh, you know, these ideas of, of connected to masculinity. Uh, Sophia, I want to turn to you. Uh, the use of sexual violence as a weapon or tactic of war has been widely reported on in Ukraine um, and it started to be documented. Uh, what can you tell us more about that effort? Thank you for your question. Uh, I feel it, there are many similarities in different contexts, but I uh, could share just some of patterns uh, and issues which I heard from the survivors I was representing in the national courts and international instances, uh, which they shared and which we see in most cases uh, in uh, Ukraine in reported cases. So the first one is uh, when we are talking like about the motives of the perpetrators, um, many survivors say that they felt and they heard uh, being under occupation that uh, the CRSV was in some cases uh, directly, uh, it was the orders and in some cases they feel that uh, it was not prohibited, 
like the uh, Russian soldiers felt that it is normal uh, within the war when it's war to conduct the CRSV. So the survivors are telling that uh, they heard that uh, their commanders may say that uh, get, uh, go and have some rest and enjoy and something like that. Uh, so it, this is the first um, pattern or uh, motive uh, which the survivors are telling us. Uh, the second uh, one is uh, that uh, the series we was uh, made with the ethnic uh, um, motive. So the, in some cases, uh, the perpetrators were telling like, uh, we will rape you, so you will not have the, uh, the desire to, born, to give the birth for new Ukrainians. And it's quite uh, common practice for the series of cases in, all over the Ukraine, because it's uh, the widespread one, and uh, we have the reported cases in the east and the central part of Ukraine. It, it's the common tendency for, for these cases. Um, another one uh, is the um, motive of demoralization of the Ukrainian army. Uh, we also uh, hear from uh, many survivors and when we are uh, investigating the cases and conduct the evidence, uh, we see the pattern that uh, the CRSV is uh, used as a tool to uh, to uh, psychologically push and demoralize the Ukrainian army. So. Mm, when uh, the serious week cases are happening, uh, the perpetrators are telling that, like, uh, okay, we will uh, do this with your women, uh, with your children, uh, and so Ukrainian army see this, and uh, uh, it will, uh, you know, show them who we are and something like that. So it's another what we see from the survivors. Uh, also, um, it was quite challenging and interesting thing for us uh, when uh, we were starting talking with the survivors uh, and that they were telling us that um, many of them were feeling that uh, the perpetrators were convincing them that it was with their consent. So they were approaching the uh, survivors uh, with the idea that uh, it's a wartime, you know, it's occupation, we are, we are uh, the controllers there, here. Uh, so the CRSV, it's like the, the normal co coincidence of war times. And some survivors, um, I feel many of them, uh, felt that uh, they really gave the consent for that, even being under the occupation, they have no access to Ukrainian uh, uh, prosecutors. So uh, in those uh, coercive environment, uh, they felt that they maybe really gave the consent by pushed uh, to believe in this by the perpetrators. And we have some cases and it's also uh, indicated in the case files that it was like the, the pushing uh, for, uh, you know, that you, you, it's your fault actually because it, there was a consent. Uh, and also, uh, just to elaborate uh, a bit uh, about the military groups supported by Russia in the east of Ukraine is in the self-proclaimed republics. It's another challenge uh, for the national justice system and for the lawyers, uh, because uh, when the series we we have uh, these cases reported on the clients, uh, when the series we is conducted uh, by uh, the militants supported by Russia, uh, but those are not from the Russian army, uh, so it's. Um, much more harder to, um, you know, prove the case to gain the evidence because it's an occupied territory and uh, the, uh, the survivors uh, are not uh, and afraid and are not willing to provide additional evidence or information because it's very close to the front line. Uh, and another issue is that uh, in Ukrainian like media awareness rising campaigns, uh, there is a lot of information now about the CRSV that it's a war crime, that like what you should do, what what rights you have, and who are the perpetrators. Uh, and of course, as the most of the CRSV cases uh, are reported against the military of the Russian armies. But uh, we had the client uh, who uh, survived from, from CRSV conducted by these uh, military groups. And uh, she even didn't know that it is a crime. So uh, the agenda and the media, you know, uh, provided many, much information about the CRSV conducted by the Russian forces. But the survivors, the potential survivors may not know and understand that it's also so the war crime conducted uh, within the context of war uh, by those military uh, groups as well. Uh, maybe I'll stop on this in terms okay. of time. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Wei Wei, um, 
in Burma, the government forces, the military in particular, have had you know, uh, a long history of resorting to sexual violence to suppress uh, minorities and opposition groups. Can you please elaborate? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, the, for this opportunity to um, share the situations and the cases of Burma today. Um, yes, actually we cannot talk about um, cannot not talk about sexual violence. Um, historical sexual violence uh, by the Burmese military. Although we acknowledge that there has been uh, cases of sexual violence by the armed resistance movement, historically is the Burmese military um, consistently and deliberately using rape as a weapon of war against the ethnic and religious minority groups, against the political activists for decades. And um, sexual violence was a hallmark of the uh, military's operations um, in 2017, uh, genocidal uh, clearance operations against the Rohingya, according to the UN International Fact-Finding Mission. And uh, during the period of um, clearance operations, the Burmese military has systematically used the act of rape, uh, gang rape, sexual slavery, and sexual mutilations. Um, the U.S. government um, determined these acts and attacks as uh, amounting to genocide and crimes against humanity in March 2022. Um, the military has used sexual violence uh, deliberately as a tool of genocide with the intent to destroy Rohingya population. Um, sexual violence also manifests itself um, in hate speech against the Rohingya and um, the military spread uh, propaganda depicting Rohingya as animals. It uh, spread messages like rape her. Um, I myself actually received um, uh, messages like rape her, um, you know, on, online and offline to these days. Although the perpetrators are the same, the Burmese military today, um, the, uh, the victims and the survivors are very, very different. Uh, nearly three years since the attempted coup, um, the Burmese military is using similar tactic across the country in a more brutal manner. Uh, the, as the special reporter on the situations of human rights in Burma, Mr. Tom S. Andrew said uh, in his last report to the UNGA, the military is committing crimes of gen um, cri these crimes in a greater frequency and intensity. Everyone who is opposing the attempted coup is at risk of violence by the Burmese military. In detention centers and prison, military has been um, you know, committing this brutal act of sexual violence as a form of torture and psychological warfare. We have seen cases of rape, uh, sexual molestations, um, and um, other forms of sexual abuses. Now that the military is taken the, these tactics of um, this tactic to the another level, forcing um, the detainees, uh, male and LGBTQI plus community, to rape each other, often blindfolded. Um, you know the conflict of, in, in the conflict affected area across the country, where military is targeting with airstrikes and um, ground uh, attacks. We're seeing cases of soldiers uh, gang raping and uh, modern young girls, pregnant women, and elderly women. Um, we're also seeing military targeting women human rights defenders with sexualized hate speech and often uh, doxing campaign online, uh, like Telegram, and um, threatening them with rape. Um, the reason that the military is becoming um, more brutal by the day is because uh, they want to terrorize uh, the society, the Burmese society as a whole, and destroy pro-democracy movement. Um, they've been able to continue this uh, act, uh, these brutalities, for decades. It's because the, uh, of the impunity. 
the mil Burmese military never been held accountable for its international crimes, including CRSB. And, um, and that is why I believe uh, the ending CRSB must focus on bringing justice and accountability um, to victims and survivors, else the pattern will continue as we see in my country today. Um, most importantly, I think, I, I believe what we have learned from uh, Burma case is that CRSB is not inevitable cause of uh, violence, rather deliberate and widespread act of violence, um, and it was completely preventable. Thank you. Uh, yeah, that's very depressing. Uh, Rosa Emilia, I'm going to turn to you because Pramila Patton earlier this morning uh, has called Colombia a light point of hope. And she referred to the uh, fact that the special jurisdiction for peace, that is the transitional justice mechanism that was established in 2017, agreed to look at sexual violence uh, committed during the conflict. Uh, committed both by the FARC, by the state security forces, as well as the sexual violence and assault and abuse that was committed within the FARC and within the state security forces. Um, what do you expect of this, um, of this uh, initiative or, or the fact that the special jurisdiction is now going to look at this? Thank you so much for the question, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here. And yes, we have this special, uh, special peace. Uh, in, in the peace process, we have this special justice trial for special justice. So I can say that we have I mean, it has been a high struggle for women to really have a case. And I think the first thing we must say is that is the first official case that is open in this kind of places in the world. I mean, this is very uh, innovative and, and but it's also very challenging because we don't know we don't know how to do it so the first challenge we have or that women have is that we are five years after the special justice uh, was open the transitional justice so uh, women and victims and everyone has been struggling to have this case, but the special uh, justice, transitional justice space is going to be for 10 years, and now we have already five, so we are five years late to be open in this case. So it is called the macro case 11, and then we have to do what mm, we haven't done, for the next five years. So that means that it was really very hard to make this case being open because they, they didn't know how to. They, they really didn't know how to. So, and, and because it is six years after, now we have incredible challenges for this. And the first one is, well, the um the quality of the uh, ad, uh, advisory legal advisory must be very very good because all the evidence and everything you know it's it it has not prevailed all the time so we need really to he, to be very qualified legal, legally, because if not, it's going to be very difficult to demonstrate what, what happened uh, so long ago. So I think this is a very, very big challenge. The second thing that I, 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 I think about these uh, cases is that it needs that the independent justice, the women's organizations, 
have to be really very fund because if they don't have the instruments, if they don't have everything, it's going to be very hard to debate and to have all this coming forward. Because, you know, in Colombian society, there is a lot of resistance to understand that we have such cases of sexual violence. It was it has been hard for the society to realize that it was such an extended sexual violence in our country during the conflict. And now, a, and to understand that this is not because only of the conflict, it's because we have a very patriarchal society that has exacerbated a lot of values, a lot of things that we have in daily life, they have been exacerbated during the conflict, and the outcomes of that has been an extremely high sexual violence against women. The other challenge is that um, sexual violence and other based gender cases are on the other 10 cases. So not only women have to go through the 11 macro cases, but also they have to be present in all the other 10 cases because um, there are also cases that are related with sexual violence, but they are nominated up as different cases. Disappearance, another, another. And also, um, we, because in Colombia, and in this case, and this is very important to say, sexual violence um, has been, it is a crime in itself. And it's not, uh, it is not subject to amnesty. Uh, so that is very important because it is going to be punished. You cannot, um, get away with this kind of sexual abuses. And um, also we have to say that uh, because of, uh, it's so difficult and there is a lot of tension between even women thinking what is justice? I mean, how to understand what is traditional, what is transitional justice? in sexual violence, because sometimes many women are really thinking, so we are going to have back to our communities the perpetrator, and we are going to see them working with us here, and they say, no, no way. We don't want to have them here. We want them away. We want them in jail. We want them really far away from us. So the concept of transitional justice for sexual violence in itself is really a challenge. What does it mean, transitional justice for these type of crimes? Is So there is like discussions, division, and also we think that that uh, transitional justice for us is like building a new kind of justice in the country. It's not only a justice for a peace process, because you know that the peace process for us is a tool for change. So this is also a tool for changing the idea of justice and how we have this approximation to, to justice nowadays. So it is a huge discussion between society. And for finishing, I think that truth and victims in the center is one of the things that Colombian are all the time saying, victims in the center, and we need to have truth. But I th we all think that the sexual perpetrators, the FARC, the army, and uh, we have already some cases about paramilitars, because as you know, the paramilitars are the biggest perpetrators, and then uh, FARC and militars. So they are not going to say the truth, because it's very difficult to say the truth about sexual violence. It's a shame, and, and really it's very difficult. So we don't know what is going to happen, but we suppose that 
eventually we and uh, it's going to end in confrontative justice and we are working yeah that's the way things are moving forward well thank you rosa emilia you have made it very easy for me to make the transition to the second question that is about the responses uh, and uh, the responses both within societies as well as from the international community, way, way, uh, what should happen to uh, change the situation in Burma? Um, so unfortunately, um, in Burma, there is no domestic or national mechanisms to bring, uh, to address uh, uh, conflict-related sexual violence. Um, the Burmese government and the military uh, uh, traditionally, historically denied these cases, including the sexual widespread sexual violence against Rohingya women in 2017, even by these uh, uh, by the democratic leader Do Aung San Suu Kyi. So it is really hard to talk about what we have in in Burma. Therefore. Um, Many of our civil society groups have been calling for the international uh, responses. Um, it has been decades of the military's uh, atrocity crimes and uh, six years of genocidal attacks against Rohingya, and now three years after attempted coup, these violence are ongoing. Um, and, and this is also widely uh, uh, re reported, uh, including by the UN fact-finding missions uh, on Burma. Um, however, the response seems to be very slow and ineffective. Uh, it is because I uh, realize uh, these crimes are not taken seriously by the international actors, um, especially when it's come to Burma. It's a lot about their political interests and politicizations of the issue itself. Uh, it's 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 a it's the failure to look into the seriousness of crime as it is and responding, responding to it uh, effectively. And also there is no, I think, uh, effective internationally um, uh, exercise practice mechanisms to address it. So it's all about the, um, the, the political will of the uh, state actors, especially when it's come to the UN. Um, uh, when we talk about uh, justice and, and accountability specifically. And um, um, so, you know, we have uh, made a number of uh, the development on the international justice front um, that include um, the uh, investigations by the International Criminal Court, not necessarily related to the sex conflict-related sexual violence, but um, the, the case of forced deportations of Rohingya uh, to Bangladesh, as well as uh, we were able to uh, get uh, an independent international mechanisms uh, on Burma to investigate um, the military's crime. Uh, we are encouraging these um, mechanisms to be uh, more inclusive and, and, and basically um, uh, take the cases of sexual violence seriously and really put effort to understand the different nature, diverse nature of the contacts and, um, and, and the, the nature of the crimes itself against um, in Burma, because we have such a diverse country. The tactic, the motivations, um, uh, the um, uh, the, all the practices that they have deployed in different contexts, different groups, uh, different victims group is dif uh, different. So it is important that these mechanisms, one, um, take this issue as a serious issue, and two, make it more a, a victim-centered approach and basically understand what is going on. Um, one, I think, progress that we have, not progress, I think one achievement that international community was able to make is the a, a communique by the uh, SRSG Pamela Patton in 2018. However, even that one is extremely flawed, lacked involvement of the civil society groups or victim groups, and it's 
uh, to this day unimplemented because of the coup. So we are still very early to talk about transitional justice or um, any forms of uh, reparations for the victims and uh, the conflicts are ongoing. The, uh, hundreds of thousands of refugees um, and displaced persons are still living in limbo, whether inside Burma or in Bangladesh. Um, so I think we really need a lot more support and work uh, to, to, to get uh, this th issue resolved. Um, on the other hand, there are some progress uh, we're making domestically among, after the military coup among the society. Uh, Burmese democracy, pro-democracy movement um, th uh, have been putting a lot of effort to basically able to address this issue once we uh, are uh, once we defeat the military, basically, uh, especially through the uh, women's group, through the National Unity Consultative Council, which I am a, co a council member as uh, representing WPN. We're trying to develop uh, transitional justice policies uh, and uh, gender policies and, and other po necessary policies so that we can basically address uh, these crimes, uh, including CRSB. So, I think you know we we don't have a a, a lot of like good practices or uh, work has been done, but we're still in the early stage, and we need a lot of your support to help us overcome from this um, crisis. Thank you, uh, Sophia. Maybe in Ukraine it's a little bit different. I think there's actually a lot of attention to uh, the crimes committed by uh, Russian soldiers. Yeah, just uh, I would like to provide the brief uh, description of what we have and what uh, the responses should be or what recommendations may be. So uh, at the uh, when the the whole scale invasion uh, in t uh, 2022, uh, we had the uh, article in the criminal court uh, which uh, covers war crimes, including CRSV. So it doesn't specify the CRSV and it needs to be amended and and uh, broadened. Uh, but uh, we had this. Uh, at that time uh, and just to mention that it was not used before the 2022 so the, the war started in 2014 and we had the reported cases of uh, CRSV in the east of Ukraine uh, and they were uh, classified under the uh, another article uh, which covers the uh, uh, activities of the terroristic organizations uh, so uh, now these cases are being reclassified under this article which covers the war crimes uh, but despite the fact that we have uh, this article, uh, when uh, the cases started to be reported, uh, we the legislation lacked uh, the uh, approaches and the procedural guidelines uh, for uh, investigating the CRSV cases uh, based on the international standards. Because actually, this article just refers you to the uh, international humanitarian criminal law, and it doesn't specify it like anything. So you should uh, the investigators, the prosecutors, they should understand how to apply uh, the international standards, the international law to investigate these crimes, uh, the war crimes, not the general criminal offenses, because our national uh, criminal procedural legislation uh, just prescribes uh, the uh, approaches and the mechanisms for investigating the uh, general criminal offenses. And now we have the situation when it's they, be, they are being used to investigate the uh, war crime by the national uh, investigator, uh, investigators and the prosecutors. Uh, and it really puts the additional uh, traumatization for the survivors. Uh, and when they got into this proceeding of the uh, criminal uh, investigation, uh, they are put it into more trauma because of application of these uh, standards and approaches which should be applied for the general criminal offenses. Just an, some couple of examples. For example, the, um, when investigating the CRSV, uh, the investigators uh, put the burden uh, of proof for the survivor of the consent. Uh, so they should investigate the coercive environment if it's the war crime, yeah. And they approach this at the general uh, offense, the rape, for example. Uh, in other case, it's, there is no uh, protection program for the victims. And for example, uh, we had the cases, now it's changed because uh, the civil society organizations uh, kind of pushed the uh, 
authorities to do that. Uh, but in the beginning, the notices of suspicion were published uh, on the website of the OPG, uh, the prosecutor office, and the names of the survivors were indicating there. Uh, and for the survivors who are living in the, near the front lines, it was just the additional, uh, you know, issue of safety and security when they reported about the case and they, their names are published. So the law and the protection of victims and witnesses is also like really need to be amended, and uh, we have a lot of things to do. Uh, so a lot of a lot of issues, but uh, if uh, yeah, and also just to mention, we have the cases when the uh, survivors uh, were accused of collaboration uh, collaborationism. And uh, and it's another issue uh, which we need to work in. Uh, but if we are talking what to need to be done, it's first I would say uh, that the response, the international response and the uh, mechanisms which are proposed should be very adapted to the national context, but because it differs. And for example, in Ukraine, the cases which happened before 2022, they uh, felt like uh, to be not covered by, by uh, what is going on now. And uh, all the system is focused on what is going on on the a uh, whole scale invasion. Uh, another thing it's very important to conduct the training of the investigators, the prosecutors on the international humanitarian law and criminal law because we can have the brilliant system establish the departments, the structures, the legislation, but if the people who are working with the survivors in the field don't understand this and don't really believe in this and understand the roots, the approaches, the victim-centered approach, it will not work. Uh, another, I would say that uh, it's very important to understand what is the result for us. Um, what I'm talking about, that it feels like in Ukraine, uh, the system um, aimed to is to show the result uh, in a maybe with a positive, uh, you know, um, roots for that. But uh, if we are focusing on just a number of cases forwarded to the court or, or the number of indictments, it's probably not the result. Yeah, the result is the provi provision of really justice system for the survivors, because in Ukraine, for example, we have the in absentia proceeding. Uh, prescribed by the legislation and most cases, uh, CRSV and other war crimes, uh, uh, conducted within this in absentia proceeding. Uh, it, it helps the system to show the result, the cases, because you can, uh, you, you know, conduct the uh, so kind of quick investigation, but it really influences bad the quality of the investigation of these cases. Okay. So it's another question. And ju just, just the last one, uh, that uh, if uh, we are talking about the system which will uh, help the internet National, the, the other countries uh, to lead with the establishment of the system and also to build the national uh, system. Um, we think and the civil society organizations are advocating for the hybrid mechanism, which will help to bring the international expertise and to prescribe the rules for investigating the war crimes. Uh, and on the other hand, it will include the national systems as well, the judges and the prosecutors, because we understand that they will be the main uh, who should respond and investigate these crimes, because the uh, universal jurisdiction or ICC will be uh, not uh, doing the, the main part of this. So the hybrid mechanism seems to be uh, as an effective option uh, for, for uh, hearing okay. these cases. Thank you. Uh, very briefly, Ali, and then I want to go to the audience. Mm. Uh, yes, uh, I'll be uh, very brief. Uh, regarding the responses to sexual violence, uh, I would like to say that it's extremely difficult to develop ad adequate responses if causes uh, are not uh, well uh, known. Uh, because when we see sexual conflict-related sexual violence, we are likely to say that only military, or only soldiers commit sexual violence. But I can tell you that civilians extensively commit sexual violence in armed com uh, in, during armed conflict, which poses a serious definitional problem. What does conflict-related sexual violence mean? Only the one committed by soldiers or by civilians uh, as well. So, um, uh, and uh, you know, there is a debate uh, in, the, in the literature that oh, do the pre-war, does, does the pre-war uh, level of sexual violence influence war-related sexual violence? I'm, I'm gonna give an example. I don't have, I don't have answers, but I, just to, to, to raise some, some, to bring in some reflections. I know a soldier and who, who married, who used rape as a tactic of marriage, 
Uh, he was already a soldier, a commander in, in one of my, my armed groups in Ruzizi Plain. So he sent out his soldiers to bring a woman he loved, and he raped her, and then she became uh, uh, his wife. And up to now, they are living together. But this rape is a tactic of, of marriage, it dates back from pre-war period in, in, in different Congolese uh, societies. And, and it is reflected in, in the army, because some soldiers I spoke to told me that they did not, some learned to rape in the army because sexual violence could be used as, as, as a tactic of war. But others told me that this is a behavior you come with from home, but not, 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 not in, in, in the army. So sexual violence is a very complex problem. Now we have been taking some quick conclusions. Uh, I agree that the discourse of sexual violence as a weapon of war is simplistic, but that statement is also simplistic in itself, because there are so many things we don't understand in, 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 in this process when sexual violence is used as a weapon of war. I'm wondering under which conditions, because I spoke to one soldier who, who told me that he quitted the army because he was forced to commit rape that he didn't like. So I'm not sure what he was raped as well because he was forced to rape. He, feel, he felt also victim of, of, of sexual violence. Uh, but we, we, we don't understand how this process works. Uh, from the Western point of view, you have to have some written laws that this is a policy. No, maybe not everyone writes the policy. Maybe it's, it's oral. Uh, uh, so some, some of the soldiers told me when they receive order, it, 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 the, the commander doesn't tell you, go and rape. He can tell you, for example, go and pay yourself. Show them uh, that we are, we, are, we, are, we, are, we, we are strong. So there are many different ways that the order could be expressed and, 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 done that, and this expression transcends some, mm -hmm. uh, so, some, okay. some of our under, cultural understanding. So we, and, and how do soldiers react to the orders? Who is more likely to commit rape? So there are so many questions that we can research on. You can conduct the whole research on opportunistic sexual violence. You can conduct the whole research on sexual violence as a weapon of war. So mm. all these theories could come together. We, so, we, so not only one is true, so all of them could be true. Maybe we need a general theory of sexual violence. Thank you, Ali. I think uh, you. you're raising a lot of questions and also uh, connecting with the points that Rosa Emilia was making about, you know, the patriarchal nature of societies uh, that are of influence. I want to open it up to the audience, uh, Mindy, and please state who you are and be as brief as possible in terms of your question or comment. Um, my name is Mindy Cutler with Asia Policy Point. I'm a historian. Um, I want to know what do you do when the perpetrator starts to deny and backtrack? And I say this in the context of the most important contemporary historical of war crime and sexual violence, which is the comfort women, uh, which was uh, sex slaves for the Japanese military and bureaucrats that were was created by the and managed by the Japanese government during the 30s and 40s. Um, in the early 90s, the Japanese government made some progress in giving some apologies, some kind of reparations, but there was never an official cabinet decision sanctioning this. And so starting with the Abe government, they started to re-examine um, these statements, uh, question the women, question even the scholars that said these things. And so there's been a massive backtracking officially to um, deny that they were, it was state-sponsored trafficking, state-sponsored sex slavery, and even to the point where in its official war apology, they no longer say learning from history. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you do? This is 80 years later where they're using traditional denier history tactics of discrediting the victims, sowing doubt, and even attacking in, uh, scholars. Thank you. Renata? Thank you. I'm Renata Giannini. I'm a, a fellow at the Wilson Center. 
Um, I wanted to pick up on the point that Ali was making about uh, civilian perpetrators and ask uh, Rosemilia about lessons learned on the Colombian experience regarding differentiating conflict-related sexual violence from other types. Specifically, in Colombia, we have a declared armed conflict. We have a lot of criminal violence. We have all sorts. And Colombia has different kinds. I mean, it, it counts sexual violence differently. And for me, it's very hard to differentiate coming from a background where sexual violence is very much committed with very similar impact in undeclared armed conflict. So I just wanted your input. Thank you. OK, thank you. There's somebody in the, two people uh, in the back of the room. There? Yeah. Please, and then we go to you two in the back. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, we have seen uh, many. Can you please introduce oh, yes. yourself? My name is Bina Nepram, and I am the senior advisor on indigenous issues at USIP. Uh, but I'm asking this question on a personal capacity uh, from the state of Manipur in northeast of India. First is, I just wanted to know what are the uh, different forms of, we have seen UN level, global level, but I wanted to know if there are indigenous ways of responses when these kind of crimes, violent crimes against humanity has happened in your experience, number one. Number two, I agree with Brother Ali, and I'm going to tell one example of how sexual violence and, and, and conflict has not been committed just not by state, non-state, but also by violent mobs. We saw this happening in the last five months in my home region in which women were paraded naked and sexually violated in a deep conflict situation. Number three, we are also seeing a phenomena in which ethnic groups are made to fight against each other. Ethnic groups in the process of making them fight each other, women as are offered to the armed groups or the armed paramilitaries so that they can win their battle of war. This is happening right now in the Indo-Burma border. And I want to understand how the silence of sexual violence in conflict in democratic countries, in some of the world's largest democracy, why is the conversation of rape and conflict in one of the world's largest democracy, for instance, India, absent in conversations like here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, in the back? Yeah. And then we move to the other side of that back row. And that will be it. Please be brief, because we're nearing the end. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. This is Nimad Ahmadi, the founder and president of Darfur Women Action Group. Uh, my question is that um, we, when it comes to the case of Sudan, we have a chronic and long-standing uh, use of rape as a weapon of war. It has been a deliberate policy of the state. But when it comes to solution, we want to see a solution that will transform the system because you can't prevent or respond or end violence and sexual violence against women without changing the system that used to perpetrate. But then always women are systematically excluded. And then whatever the civil society effort to participate in this solution so that they make sure that solutions are made with those who are impacted, um, voices in. So the international community and regional actors who are working on uh, bringing this solution or mediating they're doing also the same thing. They talk to people with guns, people with money and power, and women don't have any of sort of this. So we are advocating um, a paradigm shift in a solution the way they approach Sudan, calling for atrocity prevention approach um, rather than traditional conflict resolution because that promotes the status quo. So what do you think um, in terms of like policy shift and also approach shift in terms of how we approach a situation when a large scale uh, systematic sexual and gender based violence being committed. Thank you. Thank you. And then there's that. Yeah. 
Um, hello, thank you um, for all the esteemed panelists uh, and for Dr. Chantal. Uh, my name is Hannah and I'm from Unidir and you, you probably will guess um, the, the angle I'm taking if you, if you were uh, there at our session um, just before this. Um, I think this applies across the board to the situations that were mentioned, but um, especially to uh, Myanmar. Um, the Special Rapporteur on Myanmar has recently issued a report, um, UN Member States Arms Transfers to the Myanmar Military, um, and this report details known arms transfers uh, from Member States to, the, to Myanmar since 2018 and is in particular since 2021, since February, um, and it linked it to attacks on civilians. Um, so I just wanted to um, hear from you um, regarding, you know, the recommendations uh, of this report where the special rapporteur recommended that states stop transferring uh, arms to Myanmar uh, and also that an arms embargo um, be applied and be more uh, implemented uh, to see if you think that this would also uh, be a response to CRSV given that you know, uh, justice, legal response take time, but this is also an immediate action that can be taken. Um, and okay. yeah, that was it. Thank you for that question. So we're over time, and I think a lot of the questions that were raised here, we will continue each one of us uh, in the whole um, outside of this conference room. But I wanna give our panelists um, the opportunity uh, to make a final remark, and what would be the sort of one thing that you would like people to walk away with from your experience and from where you sit? Rosa Emilia. Oh, uh, I was preparing my answer to the other questions. Um, one of the things that, uh, well, support for the case in Colombia, we need qualified legal advice, as I said, so we need a lot of, of support. But I also want to raise two points, if I'm permitted. Very briefly. Very briefly. Because I uh, The first one is these are huge lessons for the new negotiations, and that they are going to be different because each negotiation and violence is different in each case. And secondly, prevention, prevention for no repetition, prevention. And third, we have to ask all this about organized crime. That is, in this moment, one of the biggest challenges we have back home. Thank you. Wait, wait. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so, in, in, for the case of Burma, I think um, it is utterly important to and impunity to address root causes to hold perpetrators um, accountable. Um, otherwise, we continue. We will see um, negative consequences of this um, uh, these uh, crises uh, in a really large scale uh, that include um, the risking these victims and survivors of. Uh, recurrence of the sexual violence and, um, and traumatizations and um, you know stigmatizations and marginalizations as a suckle as as they become refugees or displaced um, and uh, in the cases in the case of Burma like uh, not only that women continue to uh, risk uh, sexual violence across the country but also when they become refugees they risk sexual violence um, in, in other countries as they had to flee by land or by boat. And these are very, very serious cases that the international community, the entire world has been overlooking. So it is essential we must address the root causes and end impunity. Thank you. Uh, 30 seconds, Sophia. 
Okay. The one thing I would say, it probably uh, putting the survivor in mind in the center of each operations you are uh, you are making or you are aimed to make, because it feels like we have the millions of initiatives, cooperations, projects, you know, and uh, for for many reasons, uh, some of them may not influence positively the the, the each survivor's life. And when we are uh, developing the projects, when we are making the legislation, we should be very focused and, and remember that it will be probably the one thing which I would like to Thank point. You. Thank you. Ali, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> so very briefly, um, I just want to say that there is a lot that we still need to know about sexual violence. So we haven't completed the research. Um, so we should continue researching on, on this complex issue. Thank you. I would second that uh, conclusion. Please join me in thanking the panelists. And this conversation will continue tomorrow. Thank you all.